Welcome to Books of Titans. I'm Jason Staples together with Eric Rostad, and this podcast is dedicated to the influences of influencers, the books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectual scientists, and others. And we'll talk about what makes these books so important and influential, and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about these important works. Today, we're going to cover Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. A book of outrageous stories from a nuclear physicist. Not that outrageous. Well, adventures of a curious character, we could we could put it that way. Two people recommended this book in Tools of Titans. One is Peter Atia, that is at Peter Atia MD, that's uh A-T-T-I-A. So at Peter Atia MD on Twitter and eatingacademy.com on the interwebs. He's a former ultra endurance athlete, uh, wears a glucose monitor all over the place, Which apparently. I should probably do that. <laughs> and if you wore a glucose monitor, that thing would, that thing would explode. <laughs> and uh, Atia, yeah, of course. Uh, Atia is, uh, is, of course, Tim, Fer- Tim Ferriss' uh, go-to doctor for anything performance or longevity related. Uh, so of interest there and uh as you might expect given that uh datum uh atia is something of an outside the box thinker uh in terms of the establishment and how he goes about things uh again an md who uh isn't satisfied with just uh just taking whatever the conventional wisdom has been uh for however long but uh, more interested in taking a look at at uh, how things actually work and doing his own research and so on, which makes sense of why he would like this book. The other person is uh, Noah Kagan. That is at Noah Kagan with a K, K K-A-G-A-N, at Noah Kagan on Twitter. He is the 30th employee at Facebook or was the 30th employee at Facebook and uh, the fourth employee at mint.com, not the U.S. Mint, which which would make him much older. Uh, and is the founder of Sumo Me, that is free tools to grow website traffic. So these guys uh, recommended this book, which is of course by the uh, legendary or notorious or both uh, Richard Feynman. Who I'll go ahead and hand it off to Eric to give a little bit more information about Richard Feynman. Yeah, he, his uh, one of his claims to fame is that he worked on the nuclear bomb. And uh, he was a Nobel Nobel Prize winner in in physics. Uh, he also once gave a lecture to Einstein, and there's a, a little a highlight of that in this book. So that's uh, that's kind of a neat neat well, uh, part of the and, book. And, and just to clarify, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, the academic world, this does not mean that he gave a good scolding to to Albert Einstein. This means that he gave a lecture at which Einstein was a uh, a participant or a, uh, in the in the audience, essentially at this in the seminar, uh, and was part of uh, part of the discussion in that sense. And there is some of that in this in this book, some details about that. And and given that, it, it's probably obvious, but uh, he is deceased. So uh, it's it's been interesting. Most of the Tools of Titans authors, the uh, the books that we're reading, they are still alive, but. Uh, but in this case, we have uh, we have one that is is no longer with us. Okay, now before we go any further, one 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 thing I want to I still haven't figured out the title of this of this book is surely you're joking, Mister Feynman. And I really expected, especially after the first couple stories, you know, it's like oh, you know, got this really uh, zany guy or whatever. I expected there to be like some story where it was like he did something unusual or wild or something to, to elicit that line. And then I come across the story in the book and honestly, I still don't get, it. I don't get it. So maybe, maybe well, you're, you're you can, not a Brit. Maybe you, you can explain British, this to me. British friends. I yeah, can't so, explain it either. <laughs> so he goes, <laughs> uh, you know, he goes through the door, he goes to this T at, uh, at, 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 um, Princeton, which he says was uh, was was great because uh, it was, as he puts it, it was like an imitation Oxford or Cambridge, complete with accents. The master of residences was a professor of French literature, which you know, yeah, okay. But then he goes to this, he goes to this, uh, to this, uh, this tea, 
And he, he says, I go through the door and there are some ladies and some girls too. It's all very formal. And I'm thinking about where to sit down and should I sit next to this girl or not? Or how should I behave when I hear a voice behind me? Would you like cream or lemon in your tea, Mr. Feynman? Said Mrs. Eisenhart, pouring tea. I'll have both. Thank you. I say, still looking for where I'm going to sit when suddenly I hear, <laughs> surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. And he says, joking, joking. What the hell did I say? Then I realized what I had done. So that was my first experience with this tea business. <laughs> so I still want to know what he had done. <laughs> I. So it, it was, it was lemon and. Would you like cream or lemon in your tea, Mr. Feynman? And he says, I'll have both. Okay. I guess those two things probably don't go together. I mean, but I would have put both in. Know. I mean, lemon, <laughs> I often put in drinks, and cream is great. <laughs> so, I, I, get, I, I mean, maybe, that's, maybe you don't combine those. I, this is something I'm unfamiliar with that, that, um, that rule. I mean, this morning I had a smoothie in which I actually put a whole lemon, you know, minus the peel, a whole lemon, and then a good bit of yogurt and milk, uh, among other things. So, I mean, I can't imagine that they would go poorly together. I mean, they went fine in the smoothie today. I but Maybe maybe not in posh, uh, posh tea settings. Well, I mean, the thing is, he assumes in the book that we would know, like, that he had done something. But, <laughs> but he, he, didn't, he didn't know either. <laughs> but, but, now, but, th- but now he knows. But now well, he does. Well, we yeah. don't know. Like, I still, yeah. at least I don't. So maybe one of our intrepid readers out there or, uh, or listeners out there can help us because I'm, t- I'm lost on this. Yeah. That said, I do yeah. think that that whole thing on the, in, in there about, you know, whatever he heard, uh, he, he said, you know, by that time I knew what to do. This is later on when I heard. <laughs> uh, and he, he said, I didn't say, what do you mean? <laughs> I knew the. <laughs> meant error and i'd better get it straightened out so i guess that's like the princeton equivalent of you know the southern oh bless your heart or bless his heart you know it's uh, the way that works but um yeah so i i guess we can get to get to the next segment here but uh i'm i'm still i'm still a little a little bit puzzled on that i get the (laughs) thing because i mean in some of those circles but but i i still don't really get the surely you're joking part and you know, maybe maybe somebody can help us there. Yeah, it would help uh, understanding the the whole book probably. <laughs> <laughs> and a brief edit, uh, just uh, after or while I was uh, finishing up the uh, the recording of this uh, episode or the post production of this episode, my wife explained to me that uh, apparently the lemon will. Uh, cause the cream to curdle, which is something that I didn't know. And she said it's probably happening in my smoothie too, but it's, you know, ground up enough that you wouldn't notice. So who knew? Hmm. On to the next section of our favorite quotes. I had uh, quite a few in this one. The first one is uh, he got in a fight with a guy and (laughs) was trying to use the most intimidating voice and words he could. And he said all he could think of was this. Get out of my way or I'll pee right through you. Yeah, this fight was, of course, in a men's bathroom, which makes that that much funnier. But <laughs> God, yeah, that's a that's a that's a pretty good one. I'm actually going let, to let's try to alternate some of these quotes here because I'm going to give you I've got a few in here. There are some real gems in this book. Uh, I have one that I'm saving. It is definitely my favorite in this particular uh, book as a as a favorite quote. But I've got a couple that are also worth listing in there. Uh one of which is since then, uh, at which point this was after he had uh, had relied on uh, prior expert data from a, from other research in an article of his, and then that research ended up being a problem and it ca- it caused some difficulties in uh, in his own work. Only to dis- only to discover that there that it wasn't his mistake, but the mistake of depending on on others. The quote is, since then, I never pay, atten- pay any attention to anything by quote-unquote experts. I calculate everything myself. Yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, having just finished a lengthy doctoral dissertation in which I kept pulling out strands of, like, how in the world did we get to this? Like, how would anybody think this? And then I find out, like, oh, when you go further and you get back to, like, this giant in the field, this guy... 
like made this completely idiotic claim or this completely idiotic interpretation that everybody else has been leaning on since there. And oh, well, that means a new chapter for me where I undermine this uh, aspect of, you know, the field that's been dependent on this giant in the field for quite some time. And just by showing that this is total nonsense. <laughs> so you learn yeah. pretty quickly not to depend on uh, <laughs> everything that goes before because, man, some of this stuff is so sloppy. And if you want to do really quality work, you'd better start, you know, making sure you do your own calculations. So I totally related to that one. Well, let me uh, do one of my quotes here that that kind of piggybacks that on uh, in, in, a, in a slightly different way, where he was working for a company where they picked the school books to be used. And um, he, <laughs> he did a lot of travel of California, for this. actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he had to do a lot of travel for this. And then he would um, he would get reimbursed for for travel expenses. And he just kind of made it a habit not to keep receipts or or keep good, good, good book working. But he would just he would just go in and say, okay, all right, the the uh, fuel costs this, the hotel costs this, my meals cost this. And um, they they wouldn't give him money back unless he had the actual receipts. And, and his one liner to them, I thought, was was just excellent. <laughs> if you don't trust me, why do you let me tell you what what I think is good and bad about the school books? <laughs> so I, I just thought that was brilliant. You know, if, if they can't trust him on um, on uh, a meal that he has, why are they trusting him with this all important decision to choose the school books to be used for the entire state of California? Uh, I thought it was a, a, a funny and, and uh, pretty intelligent comment. Well, there. And I love the follow up to that. And I'll paraphrase this because I don't have the page open. But uh, but where he says, you know, I live in Los Angeles how and, and you know that these that I'm that I must be traveling to these places. How do you think I got there? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, sir, we still need the receipts. He's like, well, screw that. And so he decides, you know, not to get. He ends up not getting reimbursed because he was going to hold his ground and didn't believe that he should need to return in his receipts. And and he finishes off. So I'm pretty satisfied, but I never did get compensation for the trips. So he <laughs> he stuck to his guns by not uh, by not giving any evidence. So. How about your how about your next one? So yeah, my next one uh <laughs> it's just fantastic. Ordinary fools are all right. You can talk to them and try to help them out. But pompous fools, guys who are fools and who are covering it all over and impressing people as to how wonderful they are with all this hocus pocus, that I cannot stand. An ordinary fool isn't a faker. An honest fool is all right, but a dishonest fool is terrible. <laughs> and this was after he'd done a uh, an interdisciplinary conference where he discovered that all these people from other fields uh, and, he, you know, he was particularly critical of uh, of the so so-called social sciences uh, uh, and humanities representatives here. And he just felt they were uh, pompous, as he calls them, pompous fools, people who could talk in big words and, you know, in elevated prose about all sorts of things, but didn't actually make any sense and didn't actually get to the bottom of anything that they talked about. But what really mattered is that they were talking and that they were just moving air. And for him, it's like, we, we didn't actually do anything. And yet you're con convinced that you did something just by the virtue of being here and quote unquote contributing, but we, you contributed to nothing. And so, and so he got frustrated by this and just concluded that these people were all pompous fools Guys who are fools and covering it all over and impressing people as to how wonderful they are with all this hocus pocus. And yeah, again, I, man, oh, I totally, totally uh, relate to this. A again, partly because of my experience with precisely a large amount of these kinds of people uh, where, you know, one of the... Uh, <laughs> One of the places, uh, as he continues on uh, explaining how this how this works in the uh, in these fields, he says, you know, well, I, he opened up at random this particular uh, this particular article by a sociologist, I guess it was, um, who had written a paper for everybody to read something he'd written ahead of time, and he, and he says, and I'm going to just go ahead and read this because it's just hilarious. I started to read the damn thing and my eyes were coming out. I couldn't make head, uh, head nor tail of it. I figured it, be it was because I hadn't read any of the books on that list. I had this uneasy feeling of I'm not adequate until I finally said to myself, I'm going to stop and read one sentence slowly so I can figure out what the hell it means. 
<laughs> so I stopped at random and read the next sentence very carefully. I can't remember it precisely, but it was very close to this. The individual member of the social community often receives his information via visual, symbolic channels. I went back and forth over it and translated. You know what it means? People read. <laughs> <laughs> then I went over the next sentence, and I realized that I could translate that one also. Then it became a kind of empty business. Sometimes people read. Sometimes people listen to the radio and so on, but written in such a fancy way that I couldn't understand it at first. And when I finally deciphered it, there was nothing to it. Oh, this is so, so, so true. So often. <laughs> and I find that, that, that where the prose is most indecipherable like this, generally speaking, and there are some exceptions to this, but generally speaking, I find that the ideas underlying it are every bit as muddled and poor as the, as the, uh, reading is incomprehensible. And when I find that people are writing comprehensible, ordinary English and, 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 uh, and writing it in understandable ways, it turns out that their thinking is also, it also tends to be a lot clearer. So there, there is some correlation there. Now with some, there, there are occasions where a little bit of jargon or certain things are necessary to, as shortcuts. And that's where things get get difficult because in order to say certain things, sometimes you have to uh, acknowledge what has gone before and all of that as a part of scholarly discourse, and, and that makes things difficult at times. But uh, and and certain phenomena and all that are difficult to explain in 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 straightforward, non complex sentences. But the fact of the matter is that the people who understand this stuff best and the most brilliant minds are the people who take the complex and make it. And boil it down to people read. <laughs> yeah, and it it kind of goes along with what you what you were saying last week on uh, show your work with with the the experts the 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 expert experts are still the ones who are able to go back and and remember how they learned it and remember those simple first steps and be able to explain it to both the novice and the expert. Um, so I, I remember that sticking out from from last week. Yeah, and uh, and that's the that's the thing. Actually, one of the things that sticks out about Feynman in this book is he is one of those people without question, right? He understands like, wait, well, when I was figuring this out, this is how I went about. Like, here's the methodology for figuring stuff out, right? Mm -hmm. And and in that sense, I think you know I haven't read it yet, but um, uh, the the uh, the book on learning that we've got later on the list by. Uh, uh, by the, Josh, by Josh Waitskin, White, Waitskin. Um, that book, you know, and, and some of these others about learning and about how to go about gaining understanding more than just memorization and all this there, there, I think there is sort of a, a, a collection of books on our list that, that address some of that. And he's, he, he definitely does on a number of occasions in this book, we won't have even made it through our quotes before we've actually finished the podcast here. So let's go ahead to your next quote. Okay. Yeah. I, I, this is one of these where it was like <laughs> looking at the quotes, we, we actually can talk a lot about the book just from the, the quotes because it brings <laughs> yeah. up a lot of, uh, so I actually had almost had more notes in the quote section here than, than, uh, yeah, than otherwise. Yeah. But, I mean, we can stay as long as we want on this section because there's just so much to talk about. Yeah. There was, there was one, uh, one part of the book where he interviews for a job and, um, it reminded me of the, uh, the scene in Goodwill Hunting where, where, uh, Will Hunting declines the job from the NSA. And then the next time he's in the the session with Robin Williams, he describes why he decided not to take the job. And it involves, uh, you know, saving a baby seal and all sorts of stuff. And, and uh, it's, it's about a minute and a half monologue is really, really funny. And, and there's one very similar in this book. So I'm going to start off with the sentence before it. And then it's a, a paragraph of why he's not going to take this I almost job. Had so. this, I almost had this in my quotes, too. So this is uh, this is the person offering the job speaking here first. Maybe now you want to reconsider because they've told they've told me the position is still open and we'd very much like to have you. And so this is uh, Feynman now uh, in his reply. So I wrote them back a letter that said, after reading the salary, I decided that I must refuse. The reason I have to refuse a salary like that is I would be able to do what I've wanted to do. Get a wonderful mistress, put her up in an apartment, buy her nice things. With the salary you have offered, I could actually do that. And I know what would happen to me. I'd worry about her. What's she doing? I'd get into arguments when I came home and so on. 
All this, bo- all this bother would make me uncomfortable and unhappy. I wouldn't be able to do physics well, and it would be a big mess. What I've always wanted to do would be bad for me, so I've decided that I can't accept your offer. <laughs> <laughs> So I, he didn't get that job. Oh, no, he, he got the job. He just didn't take it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that was, yeah, his, yeah. Yeah, that, that was his rejection yeah, and, and letter. The, yeah. And then, uh, like, the more he rejected, they kept offering more and more, more money, money, didn't they? Yeah. yeah. They, they, I think that was the University of Chicago, wasn't it? Uh, if, um, I remember, if I remember right. Uh, from yeah, the, from yeah, the book. yeah, that was University of Chicago yep. and they were offering him a fortune to come up there. And he's like, you know, I kind of like living where I live. And, you know, I got, I like, you know, the, the, the gig that I've got and all this. And they're like, yeah, well, you know, did you look at the money? He's like, no, I didn't look at the money because I didn't, I, I didn't want to be tempted. And then they finally, they <laughs> sent him a letter that, that said, here's the money offer. Now, what do you think? And that's when he wrote this like completely sarcastic <laughs> response, which again is just classic. And you know, again, g- gets into some of his uh, some some of his uh, his sense of humor, which comes across a lot in the book. Uh, and and the thing about his sense of humor is, it's so down to earth and ordinary, right? He's just so mm. straightforward, and and that's one of the things. One of the things I really relate to about this guy is he's someone who's really inter- curious about everything, which I pretty much am, and tends to be uh, unconventional in his approach to lots of things and self-taught on lots of things, which again, I, I, I'm, I'm all, all with that. I'm on the same path, uh, same, you know, same, very similar in that regard <laughs> and doesn't take things to, uh, overly seriously most of, the t- most of the time and just doesn't understand why people do things the way that they do and try to cover everything over. There's that sort of raw honesty about him where it's like, well, why would I do it that way just to make it look different when this is how everybody really should do it or this is how I think about it? And it's just that that candor is totally there. And actually, if anybody, you know, if anybody in the uh, who's listening uh, has, has ever watched the show uh, The Big Bang Theory, uh, there's a character on there, Sheldon who is, you know, you're supposed to be laughing at about how, you know, most of the time. And I think most people don't relate with that character when I've watched that show, I've gone, man, that guy's right most of the time. Like, I get him. <laughs> because, but he's supposed to be the socially awkward one who's like, is questioning the things that nobody should question. But once he asks a question, it's like, yeah, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> and that's the kind of thing that Feynman comes in with. And it's like, well, why would you do it this way? Why would everybody do yeah. it this way? That's the dumbest way to do it. And it, everybody just looks at him like, wait, why would you question that? We're, we're all doing it like because it's not done. But why? <laughs> well, and there's a lot of there's a lot of power in that. I, I remember when I was working at Russell, uh, one of the executives would go into meetings, and he <laughs> he would ask what I thought were just dumb questions, but it turned out no one actually knew the answer. Yeah. And 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 but everybody was everybody was talking around it, so um, he could get he could get the he could get the best responses and the best information because he would just start from the very beginning. And it takes a lot of humility because you, you kind of look like a, an idiot when you do it sometimes, but he would just come in with the (laughs) most basic questions and he would actually get more information because people would have to explain it. And, and most of the other people in the room had no idea what was going on. Uh, but when they heard them explain it, then, then they would. Uh, so there's a lot of power. Well, and and this gets right. I mean, next week's book, uh, uh, James Carville and, uh, and, um, uh, Paul Begala, they talk about in, in, uh, buck up, suck up and come back when you, <clears throat> um, uh, whatever up, uh, foul up. Um, they, uh, <laughs> they, they talk about that too. They say, if you want to be the smartest guy in the big meeting, be the one that asks the basic questions, the ones that everybody else just kind of ignores and overlooks because, Nobody actually knows the answers to those questions, but if you get to the bottom of those questions, you can answer all the others. And mm-hmm. and uh, and and this is where again Feynman's approach throughout this book, the thing, the big takeaway to me on this book is Feynman just constantly starts with why, which again, that's another book on our on our list, right? Mm-hmm. He constantly yeah. he's the kid that had to have been a, a joy to raise because he's always asking why, <laughs> and you say like. 
okay, put on your good shoes. Let's go, let's go to synagogue or let's go to church. You know, put dress, you got to dress really nicely. Got to dress different here than everywhere else. And of course the answer is, well, why? I mean, this is a, this is a battle I had with, with my parents, right? There was a certain point I, I was probably eight or nine years old where I like, I determined like, well, why should I dress differently there than anywhere else? Going to a, going to any sort of uh, uh, religious type service, and it's like, well, you know, to because you know you do this as a part of going to church or you know reverence or whatever, you know, it's just what it's it's you got to play the game. And my parents were were uh, are as you know about as free thinking on on, the, on a lot of this stuff as anybody, and eventually their answer to me was, you, at some point, you just have to learn to play the game, right? <laughs> yeah, it may not it may be stupid. There may not be a good reason for it other than. Other people are going to do it this way, and you have to learn to pick your battles. So play the game in the places where it where it doesn't matter. But I would ask the question of like, well, if God is everywhere, and He already see like He sees me naked anyway, so what difference does it make if I like if I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt all the time everywhere else? Why should I wear anything else other than that to to church? Feynman's one of those people, right? You know, he's yeah. asking that question of, well, why should I, why, why would we wear something different to, to this? I mean, who cares? Yeah. And, and, you know, he over and over and over again, you see him break into, well, why? And then the next thing, once he gets to the why, is how, mm-hmm. right? Everything for Feynman is why and how. And, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he's not interested in data for the sake of data. And he makes a mockery of people who are about memorizing data and about learning all this information, but don't actually have the how or the why figured out. For him, it's all meaningless unless you have some sort of why to it. And and for him, just simple curiosity to know the answer is a good enough why in many cases, but just be honest with yourself about it. And sometimes something good comes about it. And he says, actually, it was... Uh, him just getting interested about the particular wobble of a plate and just getting really fascinated by that, that actually led to his Nobel prize. It was work that initially had no connection to anything meaningful. He just got curious and got interested in how it worked. And again, for him, real learning starts with those questions and starts with understanding the how and understanding how to get stuff put together. So I really, really enjoyed that aspect of this book, even though, I got the impression in the way it was written, and of course this was written uh, by, uh, by Feynman uh, with someone else who collected the story, so it's in Feynman's voice, but actually not, the, you know, he's not the one writing the final, final version of it, as it were. Um, but uh, there, was, there were places where, you know, he was just presented as so unusual, and, and you know, it's like, oh, this is weird, you know, the adventures of a curious character, and I'm sitting there going, why is this not normal? Like, Mm -hmm. doesn't everybody think like this? Like, this is... And I kind of got sad at different points thinking that they're realizing that lots of people are going to read this book and go, yeah, man, he was crazy, wasn't he? Instead of going, yeah, we should all be, you know, we should all think like that. We should all be intellectually flexible like that. Like, oh, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, we should all be more... And unfortunately, I think a lot of the audience would be more inclined to to kind of listening to these stories and be like, man, I can't believe somebody would do that. Like, dude, it's like he didn't. And he's, he's as straightforward about this as anybody. He didn't do anything special. Really. He just got really curious about stuff, asked why, asked how, and got to the bottom of things. So uh, uh, that's, that's the part that I enjoyed, but also kind of wound up getting a little introspective about in terms of society, uh, which (laughs) I think he he does at different points in the book as well. So, well, and for anyone who hasn't read the book, read the book. It's not structured like an, an autobiography. It's, it's, it's structured as different stories. And, uh, they, they all kind of have a, a, a similar theme of this, of, of asking why. And, and, but just, I mean, the most sometimes bizarre stories, but, uh, kind of that common theme. So it, it's a unique book in that sense where you, 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 I mean, he's in Brazil, one chapter he's in, he's, he's, uh, working on the nuclear bomb. The other chapter he's, he's cracking into safes in another chapter. Uh, he's fixing in, a stereo system for, for a friend when he's a kid. And, uh, the kid, the, his friend says, this guy fixes things by thinking about it. Yeah. It's just loosely (laughs) connected episodes. It's a very episodic and, uh, an anecdotal. I mean, there's, it's just basically a collection of short episodes or anecdotes from the guy's life. And, and yeah, you know, there's stuff that I guess a lot of people wouldn't ordinarily do. I mean, I guess that 
But to me, it was like, oh, yeah, I, I would totally have done that. <laughs> or why, why didn't he take it further? You know, it's, it's sort of my, my impression of it. But uh, enjoyed his way of thinking throughout most of the book. Um, I believe you have the next quote. Yeah, I liked, uh, I liked this one. I thought it was insightful. He said, artists are lost. They don't have any subject. They used to have the religious subjects, but they lost their religion and now they haven't got anything. And this comes in a chapter where uh, Feynman's learning how to paint. And again, he approaches it in, in his, his standard way of, of asking why. And, and, um, and then this was just kind of a, a thought he was having while reading the cha- or writing the chapter and, and th- thought it was interesting. You know, you look back at, at most of the art during the Renaissance and it is religious art and uh, you don't see a lot of that anymore. And he says they, have, they don't have any subject now. Well, and that's in the context also of talking about how so many of the artists that he ran into, because, you know, he got really interested in, in painting and doing art. Uh, and, and of course, he says that came late in life because early on he'd been so concerned about being a, a uh, uh, being thought of as as a sissy that he, you know, wanted that he avoided all things art and then eventually got interested in it and then eventually started to understand the value of it. Uh, but he 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 talks about how a lot of the people that he ran into on the art scene were just total posers, right? They were, they were trying to give off the vibe of being artists, but they were not actually artists. And, and, um, there's one in particular, uh, that he he talks about, uh, where he, um, uh, he says one guy in particular or he says, the artists were very interesting people. Some of them were absolute fakes. They would claim to be an artist, and everybody agreed they were an artist, but when you'd sit and talk to them, they'd make no sense whatsoever. One guy in particular, the biggest faker, always dressed funny. He had a big black bowler hat. He would answer your questions in an, in, in an incomprehensible way, and when you'd try to find out more about what he said by asking him about some of the words he used, off we'd be in another direction. The only thing he contributed to this project that he was putting together, ultimately, to the exhibit for art and technology, was a portrait of himself. (laughs) Right? And that just totally typifies what what you're talking about in in, in the quote that you chose there, right? They've lost, you know, artists at least used to have the religious subjects, but now they've lost their religion, and and now they haven't got anything. And all they've got left is themselves, and they become a sort of self-caricature. And again, this is the same critique that he has of a lot of academics, where, guys, you're just a bunch of, of fools who are not actually trying, and you're not actually doing the thing itself. You're, like, doing the thing about the thing, and you've lost the thing. Like, you're, you're, it's total meaningless, totally meaningless stuff that you now have. So I, I, I really, really dug that, that aspect of it. Uh, and, and, and heck, let's just go ahead and, and blow up the uh, idea of the de- different segments of this. I mean, we can continue to go through with additional quotes. And, and I think one of the things that really sets him apart, and, and I think this is, again, getting to the principle of, okay, well, there is a lot of fake it until you make it going on, even with him, right? I mean, he mm-hmm. talks about this, like, oh, you know, people over, over the course of my life have generally thought I was a faker on this or that. But actually, I was, honest, I was being honest. I would just do it in such a way that people would think I was a faker, um, which I've totally done basically my whole life, right? You know, you, the people have long tried to figure out whether I'm serious or not or faking or not on different things. And it's, I think it's a lot of times good to just keep, keep, keep people guessing, which I think Feynman, Feynman's book is a good example of how that can work out for you. But he talks about how when it came time to give his seminar before, uh, uh, before all these people, including Albert Einstein, he says, as, as I was write, writing these equations all over the blackboard ahead of time, Einstein came in and said pleasantly, hello, I'm coming to your seminar, but first, where is the tea? Right. And he says, I told him and I continued writing the equations. Then the time came to give the talk. And here are these monster minds in front of me waiting my first technical talk. And I have this audience. I mean, they would put me through the ringer. I remember very clearly seeing my hands shaking as they, as, as they were pulling out my notes from a brown envelope. So, yeah, lots of people have that response. I don't quite understand it. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But what I do understand is this. And this is what distinguishes someone who's legit, even if you have to fake it until you make it to some degree in terms of confidence or whatever else, from the true posers. He says, but then a miracle occurred. 
as it has occurred again and again in my life, and it's very lucky for me, the moment I start to think about the physics and have to concentrate on what I'm explaining, nothing else occupies my mind. I'm completely immune to being nervous. So after I started to go, I just didn't know who was in the room. I was only explaining this idea, that's all. And that is the essence, that's the difference between someone who's actually at least becoming good at something, who's, who's, who's legit, legitimately real, and then someone who's a poser. And what it is, is it's the attention on the thing, on this other outside thing, as opposed to oneself. As soon as the yeah. attention gets on me, well, now, now I have to obfuscate or I have to you know, put up clouds of, you know, put, you know, put out some mist to cloud you from seeing who I really am. But if I'm really just interested in the physics and I've got something to potentially present, well, it doesn't really, I, I'm really, I, I'm, I'm incidental. Like, I, yeah. it doesn't matter what you think of me. The question is whether or not w what I've got here is worthwhile. And, you know, hopefully it is. And yeah. I totally relate to this because, I mean, this gets back to uh, my dissertation topic actually was I was sort of I finally was able to win out that I was going to do my dissertation topic through a similar situation where when I first uh, arrived at, uh, at, at the place where I did my, my Ph.D., I arrived with an, with a research topic pretty well formed saying this is what I want to do because I think there's a major hole here in, in, the, re in the research. And I think that generally speaking, the, the whole field has gone amiss here. Uh, and when I presented it uh, initially to my advisor, he kind of looked at me and was like, yeah, that doesn't sound like anything in that field, like in the field, like <laughs> that's pretty far. That's pretty far out, man. Like maybe. And he goes, how many how many classes in this particular area have you you taken? And I said, none. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, yeah, it kind of sounds like you're an autodidact here on this. So um, why don't you go over and, you know, take these couple classes with these couple people who are experts in that area. And then, you know, maybe we can maybe that maybe you can get a little straightened out and get brought more in line with the general scholar scholarly discussion here, because, you know, this doesn't sound like it's in dialogue with anything. Right. And um, so what I did is I did I did agree to uh, I went and took uh, some classes that ended up being very you know well worth it and and helped refine some things for me as well uh, in that area, but, but I also submitted my proposal to the uh, national, uh, which is the also pr the primary international but the national uh, 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 annual meeting for my field, in that uh, uh, I presented a proposal that was the sort of kernel of where that research was headed to one of the more difficult to get into sections for that field and then wound up presenting the paper that year. <laughs> I got it accepted and, and wrote and presented that paper that year at the, uh, uh, at the annual meeting. And, um, and one of the things that's funny is, <laughs> so there's a couple things here. One is I, pres I submitted the paper without, I, I didn't realize that, you know, the protocol in our department had, or in, in my particular area had always been to make sure that my advisor or that, you know, your advisor looked at whatever you were going to propose in advance before you proposed it. So, you know, you could vet it and all this before you sent it out. Well, I didn't realize that was protocol. So I just sent it out, got it accepted. And then I also didn't know that it was protocol to make sure that in advance, well, first of all, as a student at that time, you know, you're supposed to have only present stuff that you'd already written. Well, I hadn't written it yet. And I didn't realize that it was protocol in my department to make sure, or protocol in my area, to make sure that my advisor had read the paper before I presented it. <laughs> that was never crossed my mind. It was like, well, you know, it's right, so I'm just going to go present it. <laughs> and then I get up to uh, the, the conference, which was in Boston that year, and uh, I look out, and uh, at t so there are multiple papers in my section, but for my paper, every, like the, the, the room probably seated 90 and the room ended up overflow to where there were people out in the hallway because apparently my my abstract for the proposal that had been printed in the little book had attracted that many people. So it was like overflow all the way out into the hallway, which is fine because my voice can be heard. But um, and I look out and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's such and such. And that's so like I'm looking out at like probably seven or eight of the top 10 scholars in that particular field <laughs> as I'm like sitting up at the table 
And my response was totally not like, oh, wow, I'm nervous. Like, I should be nervous. Like, I wonder what they'll think. It was totally the opposite. It was, all right, good. I finally get, you know, I've got, I've got an audience here to, to you know, correct this. <laughs> like, they're going to finally see this. <laughs> and I got up and, you know, was totally comfortable. Because for me, again, it was not about, I don't care. Like, what do you think of me? I don't really care. Yeah. But I really care about getting this research out. And I was confident in it. And, you know, gave the presentation and it turns out that the next day, one of uh, probably the top scholar in the world and that in that in my field uh, caught me in the uh, in the um, in the exit in the, one of the book exhibits and pulled me aside. And he was like, I was at your thing. Yes. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I saw you there. And he's like, I've been working on this problem for 30 years and I think you solved it. Wow. And then he got in touch with my advisor and was like, I just felt like, this is mind blowing. Like, I can't believe like, what, what, what have you been doing with this? Too? And Bart <laughs> is going, um, and he, he gets me, gets me at the, at the, at our little, uh, reception for my institution, like the next day. And he's like, what did you do? Like, what did you present? Cause I'm getting this feedback from different people who are there, former, for, my former students, others. It's like, and then one of his other students, one of the, one of the, one of his former students, who's now, I believe at Dartmouth. Uh, goes, wait, you presented something without him having read it? It's like, I didn't finish it until last night or until the night before. And she goes, wait, you present. It's like, you're an anomaly. And then, of course, my advisor goes, ha, you look up his name or you look up anomaly in the dictionary. You got his picture next to it. So, but I totally get this, right? This is, this is Feynman's approach of when it's about, when, when he's doing art, it's not about him. It's about like he's trying to represent art. Yeah. And when he's like in an interdisciplinary con conference, he's actually not interested in hearing himself talk. He's interested in like actually trying to solve the problem. Like, wait, what are we talking about here? Wait, no, no, no. Let's get down to definitions. That way we can all be on the same page. And everybody else is looking at him funny. And, you know, and all, th all throughout his life, he's this guy who's interested in the problems and interested yeah. in the math and interested in the physics. And you get all these other people that he keeps running into who are interested in themselves. And I think that's a good message in this book of, yeah, I'm not worried about what people think of me, but I am really interested in all this stuff and hopefully I can make a contribution. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. So I think you've got another one now. <laughs> yeah. This is my last one. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Amen. And this is the, uh, this is the quote I always hear. From whenever I hear this book reference, this is this is kind of the the go to quote from this book. But um, it, it's true. It's it's pretty easy to fool yourself. And I think it's a helpful practice to always take a step back and and uh, and, and look at the situation, look at it in from from a new way and, and probably ask that question a little more. The the why question. Yeah, yeah. So my favorite, my absolute favorite quote, we're now down to that. <laughs> my absolute <laughs> favorite quote is when he says, I knew what was happening, but I made it sound like I was a complete idiot. And this is where somebody was basically trying to bribe him in this, uh, you know, textbook thing when he was, uh, when he was working on the textbook thing for, for the state of California. And you know, he's, he was just playing ignorant, like, oh, well, you know, I, I, I don't quite understand. Like, couldn't this be taken the wrong way or whatever? And he's he was just totally playing dumb. And you see him doing this over and over again in the book. And this just encapsulates this of I knew what was happening, but I made it sound like I was a complete idiot. And again, I use this strategy all the time. And you have to be willing to be to look like an idiot to do it. But you learn so much, and you also learn a lot about people in the process. And the person that I learned this from is my grandfather, who was a detective. And uh, basically, you have to ima imagine, um, if you've seen the television show Columbo, uh, his nickname back when he was on the force was Lieutenant Columbo, because that, that's, that was his persona, basically. He would come in and just be, oh, um, do you happen to have a pen? Like, oh, I'm sorry, I... I I'm, I'm just a little discombobulated. Can you explain to me what's... And he just carry... It, and, and I watched him when I was younger. He would carry on a conversation with someone. And that person might think... Like, might be thinking the whole time, like, this guy's a complete idiot. But in the process, he's gotten that person to reveal, like, everything he ever wanted to know about that person's life. 
Like he's interrogated the person without having, without that person having any idea he's done so. And you realize like, huh, this whole playing dumb thing has its value. <laughs> and yeah. you see him doing this throughout the book. And I loved that quote. I knew what was happening, but I, I knew what was happening, but I made it sound like I was a complete idiot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think in, in, in business sense, like, uh, that that's a really important quote for consultants. Like if, if consultants went in, even if they knew what was happening in the company, if you go in and kind of like what we were talking before of just asking those basic questions and, and it, it ties in directly with also with what you were saying about the art being about the, the person, but if it's not about the person, if it's about the art, if, if you're a consultant and you're truly trying to, to understand about the company, if, if your whole goal is to look like a super smart consultant and you're not going to ask those basic questions, you're not going to get the right solution for the company. But if you do go in, even if you think you know what's happening in the company, but make it sound like you're a complete idiot and, uh, and go about it that way, you're, you're going to get a lot more information and you're going to be able to help, help a lot more. So I, 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 uh, I like that quote as well. Yeah, and again, the the main thing that you have to remember is that it's it's if you're a consultant or whatever else, it's not about looking good on the front end. It's actually about doing the job that you were hired to do and doing a great job, which often again amounts to asking the questions that nobody asks. Mm-hmm. If 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 they were if, if asking the questions that everybody else asked actually did the job, there'd be no need, no reason to hire you, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so be the one that's willing to ask the the basic questions that no one else is doing. And that, that's really where he goes to with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After, after the quotes, the, uh, <laughs> my biggest takeaway, the thing I enjoyed the most, the chapter I enjoyed the most was the one on safe cracking <laughs> and, uh, not just, uh, some safes that might have a few bucks in them or, or some, uh, some important mementos, but, no, the safes that were at the the nuclear facility where they were <laughs> creating the the nuclear bomb. Yeah. So, and he, he approached it in just a brilliant way. It, it it made me think of think of you. I know you you have a deep interest in in picking locks. Well, uh, deep interest right. is a little far, but yeah. yeah. A, a legal, let's say, a legal interest <laughs> in. Uh, in just, but just in, in, in that, in that curiosity of, of understanding how things work, if there's a door, if there's a lock, if there's, um, uh, another part, I, I, he, I said he had, uh, he had the original hacker mindset. Oh yeah. And, uh, it, it was basically if, if one, here's what one of his quotes, one guy tries to make something to keep another guy out, there must be a way to beat it. And that was his <laughs> mentality. And so he thought that about, uh, about, about safes. And so, each of the physicists working on the nuclear bomb had a safe in their office and it would come, the safe would come from the factory with a, a general password and, and every safe had the same password. And so his first method was just to see if the person had been too lazy to change the, 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 the code Which was- and, and about half of them had. Um, and then, and then for the other ones, he could usually get into a safe just by, uh, by, getting to know the person, what they, what they liked, uh, quirks about them. He could, he could kind of figure out what they might be using as a, as a, a code for the, the safe. So it was and just that, a really and, interesting And then the, then the final two number thing, uh, where they would leave their safes open while they worked yeah. and you could see what the last two numbers were on the dial. And he figured that out. And then all you had to know, <laughs> you had a one and all you had to do is take those two numbers and then figure out what, what the, first number was, which is going to be one out of the 20 possibilities for that. And so it would only take a few minutes to basically run through the various possibilities. Yeah. Well, and it was just a, it was just a funny chapter because you've got these just absolutely brilliant people. And, <laughs> and just in, in my work, uh, like the, the higher up the people, uh, the, the worse they are with that kind of thing. It's just, it's just kind of a funny, a funny, uh, observation and, uh, for him to take advantage of this and, and not to do anything bad, but just to, um, to kind of play, play around with these people. And, and, um, and then you know, he, he even met other people who were interested in it and they would, 
exchange stories and figure out the best way to get into uh, to different safes. So really, yeah. really yeah. Uh, interesting chapter. Well, and actually, as it turned out, there was one particularly important time where they needed to get information and he was able to get it out of a locked safe <laughs> when they needed it because of his ability to do that. So his legend grew, right? Yeah. Now, and yep. As you know, I've uh, on occasion taken advantage of um, the need uh, on a university campus to sometimes get in locked doors. Um <laughs> when, well, those doors are locked and I don't have a key. So uh, sometimes that, uh, that is actually a necessary thing and it's a, it's a useful skill to have. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but I think just probably a, a, a good way of thinking in general of, of what if you are in a situation like that or, or even a, a worse situation and, and there is something impeding what you need to be able to do, uh, just that ability to, to take a step back and really think, think it through and, and think of a way around that, um, that man-made or, or other, uh, hindrance in your way. Yep. Yep. Another, uh, favorite of mine, um, <laughs> was something else that I really related to. I read parts of this or had my, my wife actually listen to the audiobook parts of this and it's like, Oh yeah. Um, he said that, uh, that when he was doing all the reviews of the various textbooks, unlike the other reviewers, uh, <laughs> who, as it turns out, he pointed, pointed out that there had been a blank book that had been distributed to all the, all the other reviewers, <laughs> and that book had actually been given ratings by a large percentage of the people reviewing it, which just meant that something was awry because there was nothing to review. And then when he pointed that out, they're like, no, 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 there clearly is. I've got a rating for this. It's like, yeah, well, the book isn't out yet. So um, just goes to show how all that works. But um, he said that, uh, this, this is one of the quotes. He says, my wife says that during this period, it was like living over a volcano. It would be quiet for a while, but then all of a sudden blow, there would be a big explosion from the volcano below. Cause he was reading down in the, in the lower level of the house. And he says, the reason was that the books were so lousy and my wife, Carrie can totally relate to this because anytime I'm reading scholarship, that is pretty much what she experiences she'll hear silence sometimes a chuckle and then fairly regular oh you've got to be kidding me <laughs> what what an idiot like oh come on like, how could anybody think and you know my the margins of my paper copy books uh have especially in my own field there's numerous places where those books just have the word idiot written into the margin <laughs> because i get so frustrated by what i end up reading where it's like really you're you're going to you're going to say you're going to say that like that's not actually possible and 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 he he had similar reactions to this and again i think it's because he actually goes in and does his own work and and actually did the the work of of thinking about how things not only uh, work on the uh, in terms of the math and the physics and all that, but theoretically speaking, how 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 must it be conveyed for educational stuff and, and all that? And I know you had had some thoughts on that in the chapters on education. Yeah, he he talked a lot about what he would see at, uh, with his students and just uh, other educators on the difference between memorizing and, and learning. And he had one quote. They could pass the examinations and learn all this stuff, but not know anything at all except what they had memorized. And um, he, he says this, the students had memorized everything, but they didn't know what anything meant. And that was one of his uh, his Jedi skills, I, I guess you could say, is that he, uh, <laughs> he just ne he, he wanted to always know the reason behind it and, and to the to the point where he would kind of develop his own language around how to do things. And then he would get into a classroom and they were, they were speaking about, uh, about it a different way. And, and he could translate it quickly in his head on how they were approaching it, but he didn't just do the memorization or, uh, how somebody had learned it in the past, but or he the tried equations, to, to, as he says, right. He would yeah, think would, about yeah, examples. Yeah. Yeah. And even, even the letters that they would use and stuff for that. And, and he would come up with his own, own sort of language for that. Um, but in the process, deeply understood what was actually going on. Whereas anyone who had just memorized it had, had, had no idea. And so there are a lot of valuable part, uh, parts of the book that, that dealt with, with education and, and memorization versus learning. 
Yeah, and and I thought you know the one place where he he got this across really well was when he was complaining about the book that um, uh, that you know says oh well you know it's energy that does this right so he he says uh, uh, you know as he gets further he'd look in, into a book and there was a book that started out with four pictures first there was a wind up toy then an automobile then there was a boy riding a bicycle and then there was something else and underneath each picture it said what makes it go. And he said, I thought, I, I thought, I know what it is. They're going to talk about mechanics, how the springs work inside the toy, about chemistry, about how the engine of the automobile works, and biology, about how muscles work. It was the kind of thing my father would have talked about. What makes it go? Well, everything goes because the sun is shining. And then we would have had fun discussing it. No, the toy goes because the spring is wound up, I would say. How, would the spring, how did the spring get wound up, he would ask. I wound it up. And how did you get moving? From eating. And food grows only because the sun is shining. So it's the, because the sun is shining that all these things are moving. That would get, across, get the concept across that motion is simply the transformation of the sun's power. I turned the page. The answer was, for the wind-up toy, energy makes it go. And for the boy on the bicycle, energy makes it go. For everything, <laughs> energy makes it go. And then he says, now that doesn't mean anything. Suppose it's wakalixes. That's the general principle. Wakalixes makes it go. There's no knowledge coming in. The child doesn't learn anything. It's just a word. And again, what he does is he draws a distinction over and over again between learning the words for things and actually understanding the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And we get lost in this in education all the time. And it's part of the one of my big complaints, again, about my particular field is people learn what they need to learn to get, the, to get through PhD exams. They learn what these scholars have said about this and what this scholar concluded about this and all that. But actually knowing the things that the discussion is about ends up being secondary <laughs> when it's actually, it should be the primary thing and the discussions about it should be secondary. And everything gets completely backwards. And that's his big complaint. It's a big complaint I, I have. And this book gets, gets to it in lots of different ways. And, and, yeah. and then he says, you know, and he, he, he contrasts this as pseudoscience versus science, right? He says, yet these things are said to be scientific. We study them. And I think, or, uh, ordinary, and I think ordinary people with common sense ideas are intimidated by this pseudoscience. So for him, the difference is that pseudoscience is about memorizing the right definitions, the right words, you know, photosynthesis or whatever, the right theories without actually understanding them in a theoretical way that that has a grasp of how they apply based on experimentation and all that and that's where his big complaint is and he says if we don't teach this better if we don't actually get to the bottom of getting people to actually learn how to learn these things and really intuitively understand them then we're we're, we're not actually educating anybody we're not getting anywhere and and mm -hmm. and I think that's a really profound insight that he has there. And unfortunately, it's a rare one, and which is just extremely frustrating. Well, it it makes me th think of uh, um, episode four where we were talking about natural born heroes, and that was one of your main critiques with the book, is is the use of words without without completely understanding them, um, or going going with an idea, but that not really being the right idea for, for what was being explained. Yeah, I, I think that's right. In, in some of those cases. Now, in others, I have to give him credit, as we did on that episode. I think it's important to, to note that in some places, he actually questions the conventional wisdom and the so-called established science. So the, the hard part is that this is a balance that we all have to fight all the time. Mm -hmm. We always have to ask ourselves, do I really understand this or do I just know the terms for it? Can I just make the, make the terms relate in the right ways and, you know, learn the equation? Or do I really understand what's going on underneath the equation that the equation is symbolic of? And that's a hard thing because we can be really rigorous and scrupulous about doing this in some areas and then just totally miss it on others. And that's something else that you see a lot of times in scholarship is really critical scholars in one area. You know, you see this with, you know, a lot of, you know, you'll see a biologist who will suddenly go on the speaking circuit and talk about philosophy or whatever. And just because he's a biologist who really understands biology well doesn't mean that he has a, 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 a darn bit of knowledge about philosophy and thinking critically about that. And as it turns out, the rigor in the one area where he knows 
what to question and who to question. And well, that's not actually as established as it seems like just gets trusted in the area that he's not an expert or, mm-hmm. you know, the person who's an ex- an expert in say, uh, classical Greece knows that, well, you know, lots of people think that this is the case, but as it turns out, it's not as well established as that. And so you call that into question, but then as soon as they, you know, have to deal with something that deals with ancient Egypt, they just cite some ancient Egypt scholar without, without, uh, without question, because clearly that's right, but they wouldn't do it in their own area. So, so yeah, that gets, gets frustrating. One other part I really enjoyed was his, uh, his comments on equality. Uh, he, he was at a conference and, and he said, um, he said, he, he was listening to somebody. He, he talked about the big differences in the welfare of various countries, which cause jealousy, which leads to conflict. And now that we have atomic weapons, any war, and we're doomed. So therefore, the right way out is to strive for peace by making sure that there are no great differences from place to pay, place. And since we have so much in the United States, we should give up nearly everything to the other countries until we're all even. Uh, and then he, he says on his way home, I started to say that the idea of distributing everything evenly is based on a theory that there's only X amount of stuff in the world, that somehow we took it away from the poorer countries in the first place, and therefore we should give it back to them. Is but this, Yeah. But, the, but the, this theory doesn't take into account the real reason for the differences between countries. That is the development of new techniques for growing food, the develop, development of machinery to grow food and to do other things, and the fact that all this machinery requires the concentration of capital. It isn't the stuff, but the power to make the stuff that is important. But I realize now that these people were not in science. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand technology. They didn't understand their time. Just thought it was an interesting uh, uh, reply to to the conference that he went to and, and his thoughts thoughts afterward on on getting confused about the the stuff and the ability to make the stuff and how that leads to to wealth and uh, not just for people but for for entire nations. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. One last one from me. Uh, This one was another one that I completely related to. He says, we both discovered something funny. He and one of his fellow musicians when he was uh, playing drums. He said, the playing department in our minds was also the talking department for counting. We couldn't play and count at the same time. And as you know, uh, despite growing up in a very highly musical family and all this other stuff, I cannot sing and clap at the same time. I cannot play guitar and clap at the same time, or, or sing, well, can't play guitar and clap at the same time either, but can't play guitar and sing at the same time. Anything that I'm doing, I have like that area of my brain doesn't split. So everybody yeah. else can sing and clap, but I have to choose one or the other. And apparently yeah. similar with him. So uh, I, I, I read that and was like, ah, there's, there's somebody else who did like, it was like this. Well, so, and I, I still, I, I still marvel at people who, who can play the drums and sing at the same time. That, oh, that yeah. to me is, is crazy. Uh, and I, I remember the very day where I was finally able to sing and play guitar at the same time, but that took forever. I mean, just many, many years of playing uh, guitar before I could actually do those same, same things together. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, that's, uh, I like, I yep. like that he brought that up in the book. All right. Now we get to our conclusions, big picture. So, uh, Eric thoughts on the book. I liked it. Uh, there's another book in the Books of Titans list called Heracletian Fire. And I liked that one a lot better. They're, they're very similar books. They're also a, 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 someone in the same uh, same type of, of situation and, and similar type of book. And that was one of my favorites so far. And so uh, I would say if, if you're looking at reading uh, a book in this, in this uh, line, I, I would go for the the Heracletian fire over over this one, but um, yeah, I haven't read Heracletian fire yet, but uh, but I, I'm I'm going to take your word for it on that. But um, and you're going to take the correct pronunciation <laughs> and butcher that one pretty. <laughs> yeah, well, there is that too, but um, I, I haven't read that one. I haven't read that one yet. Um, but uh, but I I also enjoyed this book. Um, it's not one that I would say is a must, must read. Uh, it's kind of an entertaining read. Uh, it's one that works well as an audiobook because of the episodic and kind of entertaining nature of it. You don't have to really follow along too hard. There's a lot of little insights throughout, but it's, it, again, for, for those of you who are a lot like Feynman, you might find yourself with a, a little bit of a kindred spirit 
uh, if you are one of those who, who starts with why and, and has to know how and all these things. Uh, but it's uh, like I said, it's not a not a must read, but but still a worthwhile one if you want something that's both a little bit entertaining and uh, uh, and has some, uh, you know, worthwhile angles from which to to think about to, you know, meta thinking, basically to think about thinking and learn about learning kind of thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right. That's uh, that's going to do it for us today. Before we get out of here, just a reminder that you can follow us along at booksoftitans.com. And of course, ping us on Twitter or Instagram at Books of Titans. And if you haven't already done so, you can <clears throat> subscribe to this podcast and find all of our past episodes through iTunes, the Android mar Marketplace, or your podcast manager of choice. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please make sure to give us five-star ratings on Apple Podcasts or wherever else, Stitcher, wherever else you... you, you uh, wherever you listen to to these podcasts share your favorite episodes on social media uh let us know that you're enjoying it as well uh we'll be back up uh we'll be back next week to discuss the next book which will be buck up suck up and come back when you foul up uh on behalf of eric rostad i'm jason staples this has been the books of titans podcast keep listening keep reading keep improving and keep it real. Thanks for listening. I made this.